Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hi, I'm James Thompson, one of the hosts of the Buy Box Experts Podcast. I'm a partner at Buy Box Experts and the former business head of the Selling on Amazon team at Amazon, as well as the first account manager of the Fulfillment by Amazon program. I'm the co-author of a couple of books on Amazon, including the recent book, Controlling Your Brand in the Age of Amazon. Today's episode is brought to you by Buybox Experts. Buybox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. When you hire Buybox Experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. Marketing on Amazon is very difficult. So hire an agency like Buybox Experts to provide you executive level advisory services with expert marketing management and execution of your Amazon channel strategy. Go to buyboxexperts.com to learn more. Before I introduce our guest today, I want to send a big shout out to the team at Ecom Engine. We've been partnering with Ecom Engine since the early days of Buybox Experts. Ecom Engine's Feedback 5 is designed to help you get more reviews and seller feedback while staying compliant with Amazon policies. Restock Pro helps FBA sellers forecast demand, stay in stock, manage sellers, and much more. Go to ecomengine.com to learn more about their Amazon seller software. Our guest today is Michelle Covey, Vice President of Partnerships at GS1 US, the organization that many of you will know as the firm that issues GTINs or UPCs to brands. Prior to GS1, Michelle worked at a number of firms where she held roles in project management, handling operational efficiency and strategy roadmap initiatives. Today, Michelle joins us to share her expertise on how standards help to create a more streamlined experience for online brands and customers. Michelle, welcome and thank you for joining us today on the Buy Box Experts podcast. Thanks, James. I'm glad to be here today. So let's say I'm a private label seller on Amazon. I want to put my products up on Amazon and start generating sales. Mm -hmm. I first create my Amazon listings and there I'll discover that I need a brand name and a UPC to create my listing. Amazon seller guidelines indicates that I need a UPC from GS1 US. What is that all about and why do I need to go through your organization when I just want to be able to move quickly to get my listing set up? What do sellers at Amazon need to know about your organization? Great questions. Um, I'm gonna break that down into a couple of parts. So the first part I think is important to know who is GS1. Um, So GS1 is a global organization um, we are a standards organization, um, and we rec- we have a lot of the standards. Most people know us around for the UPC barcode. Um, GS1 US is a member organization of the overall GS1 global organization, mm-hmm. yep. and we help sellers in our region to accurately identify their products and be able to um, follow some of the standards that a lot of uh, retailers and marketplaces um, have in place to help with that unique identification. Okay. So we are, um, it's also important to note that we're a member driven organization. So we bring a lot of brands, retailers, um, trade associations, solution partners to the table to help build um, guidelines and best practices on how to adopt standards. So um, again, most people know us for the UPC barcode, but we do have quite a few other standards that are used in the global supply chain to help with business efficiencies. Um, and so bringing those members together to help identify those best practices is what we do best. Are there other areas where an Amazon seller, an Amazon private label seller, would typically interact with GS1 outside of the UPC space? So I think, I think that um, not only using the UPC, as a um, a standard, understanding product identification and all the attributes associated. So what we find, not just Amazon, but other retailers, just providing that G10 or that unique identifier for that product isn't enough. You need to have all of the product attributes, um, images, product description, um, how how to best describe that inf- that product so that a consumer can can make an educated decision about that product with as much information as possible. So we have standards around product attributes. Um, the global data model is an example where we have um, structured attributes for specific product categories that brands can um, 
kind of follow and help um, when they start to share that product information with Amazon and other retailers in a standardized fashion. So is Amazon actually leveraging some of your knowledge to figure out how to build their own category classification schemes? I think Amazon um, has been interested in, in the GS1 standards mm -hmm. um, using GTINs as a um, product identifier for their products is yep. one area, um, but they continually work with us to understand the standards and what we're doing and how to adopt them into their product, catalog, um, product listings. So as a brand new private label seller on Amazon, why wouldn't I just go and buy a block of unused UPCs that I can source on eBay? They're readily available and they're typically cheaper than buying individual UPCs through GS1 US. What, what am I overlooking here that, that may get me in trouble down the road? That's a good question. Um, we recognize there are a lot of third party sellers of um, identifiers out there in the market. Um, the problem that sellers will run into is while it seems affordable upfront and they yes. have a valid UPC upfront, that UPC is not necessarily associated to their company. So going to a GS1 um, member organization um, allows that brand owner to license their um, identifiers to their company name and have that um, G10 be associated directly to their company. If you go to a third party, that G10 may not be associated to your actual company name. So um, it will be associated to a third party. Um, it will not be authenticated and it won't be able to be used in the market. It will cause um, some sellers to have to re-label their products okay. or um, re-identify it with an, um, an authentic GS1 issued G10. Can, can you talk a little bit about how does Amazon verify that my UPCs in fact are from GS1 versus from some random brand that had unused blocks that they decided to dump? So there is a public database um, mm -hmm. that GS1 hosts. It's called Gapir. Um, Gapir is a database where you could enter the GTIN and it will pull up the associated company that is um, light that ha has that licensee to that product. So it does allow for that authentication that that GTIN is properly associated to that brand owner. With literally tens of thousands of new listings being created daily, are your systems able to talk with Amazon to be able to do some of that vetting on an automated basis? Yeah, so uh, we have services that allow for an API integration okay. into that uh, okay. licensee information. Okay. And so Amazon does um, utilize some of those tools that we have, um, as well as many other retailers to do that G10 authentication. I realize I'm asking you very Amazon centric questions because that's, that's the scope of our discussion, but, but right. I, I don't want to miss the fact that obviously other retailers are also benefiting from mm -hmm. having consistent standards. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I've always been, I've always found very peculiar about Amazon is uh, you can go and look at certain product listings and th that product listing might have 10 or 12 UPCs. Uh, and some of that might be as a result of bad habits from the past, but there's no way that a product has 10 or 12 actual UPCs. Amazon is insistent on not stripping away UPCs from listings. And yet a lot of those UPCs are probably not correct. What's your point of view on any marketplace that's choosing to label individual SKUs many different ways when in fact, it's only a singular product? So there could be a couple things going on. One, there are probably some bad actors in the market that yep. are uh, listing that product and using an invalid UPC on that yep. product. Yep. Um, and so there are some um, processes in place for um, the true brand owner to be able to help remove those, what we, we call hijacked UPCs okay. from Amazon listings. So GS1 US has an escalation process to help with that. Um, there are also times where there is an actual third party seller that is um, licensed or, or has a, a relationship with that brand owner that can sell that, um, that product. Yep. Um, but traditionally, best practices are that you use the original G10 that's assigned to the product and you don't reassign a new one, even if you are an, an authentic reseller of the product. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. You really should use the original G10 assigned to the product. So a lot of um, companies don't realize that and run into problems where then you have multiple G10s associated to a product. 
can you talk about this escalation process? If I am a brand and I discover that my products are on Amazon, they have 10 UPCs. I don't know where a bunch of these came from. Is there something that I as a brand can do through GS1 or through Amazon in order to, to start tearing apart some of those inappropriate UPCs? Yeah, um, another good question. We have, because we've worked with Amazon um, for many years on this project yep. um, with you know, using uh, G10s as the product identifier, um, it has been uh, you know, called out that there's a lot of UPC hijacking on their platform. So yep. Amazon is keen to uh, help remove those as they get identified. Um, we have an escalation process in place with GS1 US. Uh, you, any user who may have this issue where their um, products have been hijacked, they could contact info at gs1us.org. Um, we have a template that Amazon, we've collaborated with Amazon to collect all of the appropriate feedback or information needed. Okay. And um, our member support reps um, can help me a member, you know, go through that uh, collection of data for that escalation. Huh. And we send it to Amazon and they will help remove those hijack listings. Very, very interesting. Okay, so so let's let's talk about 2020, a year that no one will forget. So, if you think about what's happened during COVID, e-commerce has taken off in a huge way. Mm -hmm. What what has happened at GS1 as a result of COVID impacts? Are there certain types of firms that are now using GS1 in certain ways where in the past you would never have dealt with them? I think what we've seen this year. Um, has been a shift um, in, so a lot of small businesses are now coming to GS1 to get their product identifiers, yep. um, much more so than we've seen in the past. I think with um, uh, what we're seeing are some of the small businesses that are coming to, the, to get their, their G10s, uh, face masks, PPP, PPEs, yep. um, hand sanitizers, things like that. Um, we're also noticing, though, with the shift to almost all business going online um, and e-commerce platforms, maybe um, they these sellers did not have an outlet um, to sell their product, or if they were in an in-store, now they have an e-commerce platform that they want to sell their products on that are now requiring GTINs where they may not have if they had a physical store. So we're seeing some uh, businesses now have to identify their products to be sold on um, marketplaces and e-commerce platforms. Um, but we're also seeing a shift in some businesses where maybe um, they've had to pivot their own business because what was traditionally sold in, an, um, in a retail store or in a physical store, um, they now have had to move to online. And uh -huh, so uh -huh. they may change their business model. Um, they may have changed their business or their product lines to meet the needs of the consumer. So we've seen a lot of different shifts, um, but a lot more small businesses, maybe some people who have been laid off or furloughed have now decided to take up a passion of theirs and sell something online, see if they could um, you know, make you know, right, some money right. on, online too. So um, a lot of small businesses have been coming um, to GS1 this year. I understand that your organization responded by providing new types of tools for smaller sellers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, to meet the demands of those small businesses, we recently launched um, a single G10 program um, where brand owners can come to us and license just a single G10 versus um, licensing their um, a block of GTINs through their mm -hmm. uh, GS1 company prefix. Yep. So the single GTINs are now um, available um, for a cost of $30 um, with no renewal fees, which we feel is going to make it more affordable and attractive for those brands to come to GS1 and get an authentic GS1 issued GTIN versus even to our earlier conversation to some of those third parties um, where those may have seen um, like an easier way to go. So we're trying to meet the, the needs of these small brands and help them build their business um, in an affordable fashion. When Amazon uses the word brand, they typically think of a brand as a company that has a US trademark. Mm -hmm. With GS1, I don't, I don't believe I need to have a trademark in order to get a, a GTIN from your organization. Can you talk about what it is you need from an organization for them to qualify as a brand? 
Um, we don't really have any specific requirements, you know, um, for a company to license it, whether it's a prefix to create a bundle of GTINs yep. or a single GTIN. Yep. Um, really, it's just their company name and inf contact information. Uh, we do not know or uh, regulate what they assign their, their GTINs to. So it's really up to the brand to uh, to make those business decisions on their own. So not unusual for a company to, to have a holding company name and then to have a whole series of operating brands for, for their different product lines. Right. When, when a marketplace is vetting to see whether a UPC belongs to a brand, how, how is that done when the operating company may be putting its brand name on, but not, not necessarily the, the product, the individual product brand names? So again, going back to the tools that we have, um, mm -hmm. we have that Gapir database where um, a marketplace or a retailer can ensure that that uh, company name is associated to the identifier that that um, brand is using, um, but we don't have a brand database. Um, I know Amazon has a, a very robust brand registry that they use mm -hmm. for um, brands to be able to uh, register their trademark and or um, authentic third party sellers can also um, apply or you know put in their name to, that they are an authentic reseller. Um, but that is not something that GS1 US manages. Oh, okay, so okay. Amazon business. When I was at Amazon about 10 years ago, it was not uncommon to find completely made up UPCs or recycled UPCs or stolen UPCs being used on Amazon listings. Can you talk a little bit about how has product identification evolved in the last decade or so? Sure. So several years ago, GS1 US um, updated the global standard um, on G10 reuse. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it was primarily, um, again, going back to us being a member driven organization, a lot of these marketplaces came to us and said, um, G10 reuse is really um, a problem for us yeah, because yeah. a product can live much longer on a marketplace. So um, the global standard was updated so that there is no more G10 reuse um, in the market. Um, so uh, that if a product is now uh, maybe at its end of life, um, some brands in the past used to then recycle their UPCs. Yep. That is no longer acceptable. Yep. Um, and so we shouldn't see that um, happen anymore in the market. If it does happen, um, they're not adhering to the GS1 standard. Um, so that's one, one aspect. Um, I don't think um, there's a lot of knowledge too on when um, brands need to um, like change their G10s. So if a product changes, we do have a, a G10 management standard that allow that has specific guidelines if the product um, packaging changes, uh -huh. if the content changes, um, those G10s do need to change. Um, some may or may not understand those G10 management rules. Um, and so uh, better education to the, to the brands and to the manufacturers on how to, um, you know, product adequately, adequately identify their products if their packages change um, can be useful too. So we have some micro learnings and some education and training through our learning management system on understanding those G10 management rules. So if I am acquiring G10s through your organization, there are parts on your site where I can go to learn about all these standards. I mean, you, you, you talk about packaging changing. Packaging changes all the time mm -hmm. and, and sellers on Amazon typically wanna keep the same UPC because the UPC already has some sales history. It's got product reviews and all that good stuff. Uh, without going into excruciating detail, are, are there some general, general things to look out for when products are, are having their packagings altered? I think as a brand, you have to recognize, um, the, you know, when it is important to um, uh, change your G10 because of packaging changes. So if you have any um, major declaration changes um, about your product, then mm -hmm. the G10 does need to change. If you're like I went uh, referred to earlier, if your net content changed, you do need to um update your get a new G10. Um, if you have um, a different language on your product, technically it's a different package. So if you oh. have a product that you um, have in English, but then you want to sell in France and you have your labeling in French, 
technically you should have two different GTINs because they have hmm. two different products um, okay. product packaging. So understanding those GTIN management rules, um, I think are, is really important as a brand owner so that you can um, manage um, your identification um, on your product um, accordingly. Well, is there a protocol for UPCs being stolen? I, I remember this happening a lot where uh, an Amazon seller would start listing a product or try to try to list a product only to discover that that UPC somebody had already grabbed and put on some completely different product. And yet that product, or that, excuse me, that UPC had nothing to do with the brand. It's just somebody was able to figure out the UPC wasn't currently in use. Again, going back to those bad actors um, in the market and that hijacked UPC scenario, mm -hmm. um, we've worked with Amazon with that esc uh, that escalation process to put a, okay. Uh, okay. A, a process in place to help those brand owners, the authentic brand owners, yes. um, take ownership of that listing. Um, Very good. Very good. Tell me a little bit about what are some of the problems that online brands are having today that you would like to see GS1 help solve in the future? So I think I mentioned a couple, but um, what we're seeing with the, the rapid shift to e-commerce this year um, is helping brands, one, with their um, product identification needs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, again, give, making it more accessible to them. We've now offering the single G10 on top of our prefix-based um, offerings. But um, understanding now that the consumers need more product information to make that educated decision. So everything now is in our, you know, at the touch of our hands. Most people are, are shopping on their mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and they want that information right away. So in addition to that product information is understanding product attribution. Um, complete and accurate product information is really important to make sure that you are accurately representing your product. Mm -hmm. um, if you have incomplete information, maybe a consumer will buy a product thinking it's going to be one thing, but when they get it, they're not going to get what they expected. So you're going to have a, a bad consumer experience. Yep. Um, so that product information is, is vital um, and being able to make sure it is um, consistent across channels too. So if what you're um, providing to say Amazon, um, but you also provide that to your other retail partners. So it's the same information. So your brand is consistent um, across channels is really important. Um, so we have a lot of um, micro learnings and uh, educational resources at GS1 US in our learning management system. Mm -hmm. Our learning management system is um, free to sign up for an account. Um, and we have some education there that can help brands, um, some very easy, short, um, you know, high level tutorials. And then you could get into some, you know, more in depth that are at fee, but uh, we do have a, quite a bit of resources for brands to understand just not just product identification, but the attribution and sharing of that product information consistently okay. um, to their retail partners. Okay. Michelle, your career has been very process and operations oriented. The, the discipline and structure that comes from such roles has served you well now that you're in a standards company. How would you respond to the idea that selling on Amazon is the wild west and it shouldn't be completely tamed so as to slow down you know, innovation that often happens on this platform? How do you take standards, but also give people flexibility to, to try new things out? So I think... Amazon is a very innovative company and they're not going to stop innovating. They, um, I think they're kind of a leader in innovation. Um, they continually work with us to understand standards and how they can help with that um, supply chain efficiency um, around product identification, uh, product attribution, um, validating that the product is um, a valid product and, um, you know, helping with that brand protection. Yes. Um, we're also seeing a shift outside of just Amazon um, with um, some of the innovative technologies on like contactless payment um, and uh, I'll say augmented reality or virtual reality. So a lot of companies are investing in technology um, because we now have to live in an e-commerce world. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that consumer can't go try on that pair of pants or those earrings. And so there are some virtual reality tools out there or AI tools that help a consumer see that product on their on their self to make those decisions, those purchasing decisions. So we're seeing an increased um, interest in um, AR 
VR, um, new technologies there. Um, I would also have to say that um, also with a lot of e-commerce platforms um, standing up uh, the robotics and the need for automated fulfillment centers is really um, picking up as far as an interest and being able to track the product through the supply chain, through those um, automated fulfillment centers is, um, is key to understanding where that product is in the supply chain. Um, so chain of custody, uh-huh. um, validating you know, when a product was received, when it was shipped. Um, so using a lot of our standards around um, capturing and identifying uh, information, location information, event location is becoming critical for those supply chain tracking for tra- track and trace of product. So, so are, you, are, you, are you actually involved in RFID technology development? Yeah, um, so we do own um, the standard around our um, RFID, the air interface protocol, um, but we also work with companies um, on event tracking. So there is a standard out there, EPCIS, uh-huh. um, which is actually used in the drug supply, drug security uh, supply chain app yes. to yes. help with tracking pharmaceuticals through the supply chain. But it, EPCIS is also being looked at at um, food recall and food safety. So being able to track your food through the supply chain to ensure um, you know where it is, where it came from. Okay. Uh, and then if there is a recall, we could you know d- pinpoint where that maybe that outbreak came from, and then we could you know recall just that batch lot versus having to right. take the whole product off the um, the shelf. So right. yeah, GS one is involved in a lot of those standards as well. You, you have a very unusual cross sectional view of online marketplaces today, Michelle. Mm-hmm. Working with Amazon and m- many of the other marketplaces, are there some up and coming companies, technologies, marketplaces that we should be paying attention to as brands? Um, I'm not going to say there's a specific company, Mm -hmm. but some of those technologies that I mentioned um, are really helping pivot um, companies um, to uh, shift to this new uh, e-commerce heavy uh, way of doing business. So the robotics um, automation is really vital. And I think that's what's really going to keep um, some of these sellers um, uh, successful, I guess, in the future, because um, we need things quickly. We need to understand where they are in the supply chain, um, and we need to be able to identify the products through the supply chain um, and get that information about them. Yep. So yep. Um, those that can do that and do it efficiently, I think, will will be more successful in the future. Michelle, I want to thank you for joining us today on the Buy Box Experts podcast. For those of you interested in learning more about GS1 US, please visit gs1us.org. That's GS, the number one, us.org. Thank you, and we look forward to having you join us again next time on the Buy Box Experts podcast. And now to finish today's podcast, I'd like to share some final thoughts. For third-party sellers to be successful on Amazon, a critical lever will be soliciting feedback from customers. We at Buy Box Experts are really big fans of the team at Ecom Engine and it's tools that help Amazon sellers to simplify the process of messaging customers of Amazon orders. To learn more, go to ecomengine.com. And with that, I want to thank you for listening today, and I look forward to joining you next time on the Buy Box Experts podcast. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.